Expo. We, we are, are the RGB League Student Ambassadors of Australia and Highland High School. Today we will hear from employers in a variety of career fields. <laughs> we'll also hear from representatives from state universities and local RGB colleges. The messages we hear today are sure to help us make important decisions in our educational and career pathways. Let's give our presenters our undivided attention. Remember to take notes, ask questions, and enjoy the 2021 Expo. Hello and welcome to RGV Leeds 20th Annual Education and Career Expo. We, we are, are the RGV Leeds Student Ambassadors of Australia and Canada High School. Today we will hear from employers in a variety of career fields. <laughs> we'll also hear from representatives from state universities and local RGV colleges. <coughs> The messages we hear today are sure to help us make important decisions in our educational and career pathways. Let's give our presenters our undivided attention. Remember to take notes, ask questions, and enjoy the 2021 Expo. Thank you all so much for being with us. Um, for those of you that are just joining us for the first time, this is session 5, 1030 to 1145 in the uh, AM. Uh, the career clusters that we are going to focus on are health science and human services. We have a great lineup for you all. Uh, just so for those that have not been with us yet, just so you're aware, um, we are this expo is two days long. Uh, today is the final day. We will have all these videos on YouTube um, by career clusters. So go ahead and take the opportunity to go take a look at them. We've uh, we brought 16 Valley businesses along with 43 programs of study um, locally. So definitely want to give you all as students the opportunity to be able to um, have the knowledge and and uh, the ganas to see what you're interested in. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Sandra Betancourt Centeno. She is the Regional Director of Family Engagement and Child Abuse Prevention at the UTRGV School of Social Work. Sandra, the floor is yours. Good morning. Um, first of all, I want to say that this is my first time um, presenting at this expo, and I am very impressed with the lineup, the organization, and um, just incredible amount of resources that you all have brought together for the students. And um, and that is just wonderful. And I want to thank thank the um, thank TSCC for inviting me to this. Um, as you said, my name is Sandra Betancourt Centeno. I am a social worker. I have been in the social work profession now for 26 years, which is obviously a very long time. And I'm obviously going to date myself by saying that. Um, I earned my BSW from UTPA back in 1995 and my master's in social work from the University of Houston in 2004. I have, mul I have worked multiple areas of social work with the majority being in child welfare, um, working with children, abused children specifically. Um, I have worked with um, the foster care system, both from the state and the federal level, which includes children that have arrived in our country um, unaccompanied. I've also been an independent contractor um, doing home studies to place children um, in viable, safe homes with family and next of kin. As you mentioned, I am the Regional Director of Family Engagement and Child Abuse Prevention. Just one correction there though, my Regional Director job is with Upbring. They are a foster care agency that has been in existence for over 120 years. Our agency has a multitude of programs that I will talk to you all about in a little bit. Um, primarily my job there um, is that I conduct research and help with program development. It is very interesting because 
rather than working one on one, I am working at a macro level with um, improving the systems that the state and the country have currently for children and families. Um, for the University of Texas Pan American, I, I mean, University of Texas Rio Grande Valley, sorry, all habits died hard. Um, for UTRGV, I am a lecturer, I'm an instructor of social work for MSW students and BSW students. Um, I know that one of the things we need to talk about has to do with, um, you know, job opportunities as social workers. What is there, you know, available? Um, why should you become a social worker? Right now is a, is a great time to look at developing your career in social work. And let me explain why. A lot of the, um, a lot of the tragedies that we have seen um, occur around the country regarding police violence, issues with mental health, um, people, um, clients, all of that is now gearing towards involving social workers at the front lines for intervention, having more social workers in law enforcement, um, in the mental health field with students. So the profession is going to be growing significantly. The need is going to be there. And this is a great time to prepare yourself for, a, for an industry that's and, you know, unfortunately, has does not have enough people in it, but will be needing a whole lot more people prepared and educated in the social work profession. Um, for the up, for Upbring, which is the agency that I primarily work for, where I said that I do conduct research, um, our agency is a very large, very vast agency with multiple programs available. Um, for entry-level social workers with a BSW, we have case management, both in foster care for state, ch for children that are in state custody. We also have foster care programs and, and agencies that have um, shelters for children that arrive unaccompanied. We also have residential treatment centers. We have a, a huge um, amount of, of impact on multiple communi communities across the state. We have... Um, we have other programs as well, like Head Start programs. We also have outreach programs um, that house community centers. So Upbring is a very diverse agency with a lot to offer. So if anybody's looking for employment, it's definitely a first, you know, a place to look at. Because aside from coming in as entry level, there is always a potential for growth, development, and to move up within the agency. Um, to become a trainer, to become a director, a supervisor, a lead case manager, and to even enter into corporate jobs as I have with the experience that you build from your experiences out on the field. While I'm not a researcher um, trained, um, my experience and uh, working with multiple, multiple populations led me to the great opportunity to work as a researcher at Upbring. At UATRGV, if you decide to become a lecturer, you would need an MSW. Entry level there is has to be an MSW or higher. So just something to keep in mind. In regards to, to skill building and what you should do, um, you know, now as a student. And I tell this to my BSW students as we work through the regular classes as a side note, you really need to learn to interview clients, you need, really need to learn how to do a good assessment, but also you have to have very strong writing skills. You, this is a great time to, to develop your writing skills. If you feel that this is an area that you're not good in, most schools will offer tutoring, will offer, offer a resource to help you improve your writing skills. Writing is very important, especially in social work. If you don't document it, it didn't happen. Um, your documentation at any time could go to court or could be used by law enforcement or by many other, many other, you know, different, you know, communities, resources out there will need or depend on a social worker's documentation. So the, the most that I can tell you is that any job you go to, having strong writing skills is going to be key in how um, you come across and how you present yourself. Um, one of, you know, some of the some of the things that I also want to encourage is when I talk about interviewing people, our current generation does a lot of informal, non-face-to-face -face communication. They do text messaging. They do social media. Um, while that is all fine, um, when you're dealing in a professional um, community, when you're dealing um, with a client, with a family, you really need to practice 
the, the social skill of conversation. It is almost a dying art, but conversation is very important. And being able to dialogue, keep a communication of line open, being able to engage somebody is very important in the social work profession. So I highly encourage each and everyone to practice those skills um, and rely less on the text messaging or email as a form of communication. Lastly, I want to share the other important areas right now that as a student, you could really help you in developing yourself into a professional uh, social worker is build your resume. What I mean by that is, you know, you, you know, this is a very good time for you to volunteer. I currently have BSW students that volunteer in multiple agencies from CASA, which is court appointed special advocates to working at the respite center with incoming immigrants. Um, there's multiple programs out there that need assistance. And this is a really good time to volunteer, to lend a hand. These are difficult times as a community, as a nation that we're going through. And being a social worker and being there to, to help out is great. As a student, it's a wonderful thing to do as a learning experience as you grow and develop, but also it helps you build your resume. Um, I would also caution students about social media. I know that everybody has some type of or multiple forms of social media. Employers now do look at your social media. And um, fortunately, sometimes um, what might seem um, funny, quirky, or you know, a, a moment of venting um, could come back to haunt you. Remember, social media records things, keeps things, and once it's on the internet, it's very hard to remove. So be conscientious of what you post and what you have on your social media. Um, many agencies um, that are looking to hire prospective candidates will look at it, will review it, the content, and to see if you're actually a good match for the agency that you're applying for. If you're going to be applying anywhere, please know your agency. Make sure that you walk in having done some research, not only on the job that you're applying for, but what the agency stands for and what they've been doing. And do you agree with their mission statement and beliefs? Um, I once had to interview a, a BSW student who really wanted to work at one of the agencies that I was a director at. And it was a, a child-based, um, child-friendly, child-focused agency. And one of the things that she said was that she did not like children. Um, that obviously is not gonna be a good match. Um, she said that she could do any job as long as she didn't have to work with children when the entire agency was based on children. So please make sure that you're aware where you're applying and what your, what your job will entail. And if it's not your niche, then look for something that's more of a match to what you feel that you are capable of doing. Um, so lastly, I want to say that um, two things, and one of them is that interviewing is practice. To get a job, interviewing is practice. Sometimes we sit in a job for so long that we lose the, um, the knowledge of participating or being interviewed. Um, as, a, as a newcomer to the profession, one of the things is that most people get very nervous before an interview, which is natural, especially if you really want the job. One of the things that I would highly encourage is um, practice being interviewed by a peer, by a mentor, by maybe somebody in your in your in your career field, and tape yourself being videotape yourself being interviewed, so that you could look at it and see what areas should I improve. And lastly, as my time is up, lastly, my last tip and recommendation for all students wanting to venture and out into the world is always acknowledge your worth. Um, always acknowledge your worth. Um, there's a lot of things that you do greatly and never give yourself credit for. So don't be humble when you go in for an interview. Show them your worth. Um, everybody has something to bring to the table. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andrew. Definitely a lot of great information there. I think the key takeaway, uh, especially like you said, in this day and age is technology and, and the, the forms of social media these students use. Remember that once you post it out there, it's out there forever. And, you know, just like just like you mentioned, there's so many, so many, so many organizations, companies that do look at your social media and uh, um, it's, you know, it doesn't it doesn't help you. Let's put it that way. So thank you so much for your time, Sandra. We definitely appreciate it. Um, thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Next, um, we have a presenter 
from DHR Health. Um, his name is Mario Liscano. He is the administrator of corporate affairs. So I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Liscano. Thank you so much. You're, mu you're muted, Mario. <laughs> All right, you got me there. Okay, um, thank you so much for allowing me this time. I think it's important for us to take the time from the schedules we have uh, at our hospital, at the different health systems around this area uh, to make sure that we provide this information to our youth. And it's important for us to be here today uh, because uh, we've been going through such a tough time lately. And that didn't affect only uh, the different older population. It didn't affect us in the workforce, but it started affecting our youth. So it was important for us to understand that first of all, we needed to uh, increase our communication. So I'll start off with my name. My name is Mario Liscano. I am the Administrator of Corporate Affairs here at DHR Health. I've been here for about 17 years. And prior to that, I was at a community hospital for about nine and a for-profit hospital for about four. So I have pretty close to about 30 years experience in the healthcare system. Uh, one thing that I do want to tell our students today is uh, to believe in yourselves, to believe in yourselves. I uh, truly believe that our youth today are very resilient and they were given something that none of us thought we, we would be able to um, ever see, which was something that was restraining us from day-to-day -day life. So with that, we uh, have evolved into providing a lot of different services, a lot of different uh, lines of services for uh, all sorts of our professions. One thing, of course, that was talked about in the last session was on research, and that's something that's very important to us. Being here in the health uh, system, applying vaccines to hundreds of thousands of people. And uh, we also understand that we, we needed to research into what was the cause, what were some of the alternatives, what were some of the things that we need to look in the future. So the, so the job uh, market in research is gonna be something great. It's gonna be something that's gonna be uh, not only new, innovative, uh, you know, available, but it's gonna cover a lot of span of a lot of services that we may think that uh, we weren't looking for in the past. Uh, we, we definitely found out also that we needed every single person on our workforce uh, at, at all levels. So health systems makes a large portion of the job market here in the Rio Grande Valley, here in the state, here in the nation, uh, there's a shortage. We have a shortage of nurses, we have a shortage of physicians, we have a shortage of therapists and pharmacists. Uh, we saw pharmacists having to inoculate people and, and actually give vaccines, uh, something they were taught while they were in school, but never thought they would be putting it into practice. So a lot of our pharmacy uh, students were here, we're making sure that we were uh, um, uh, not only trained, but training others. Uh, and that's something that's important. It's important for us to, to make sure that, that we are the trainers uh, and trainees as well. I'd like to just uh, also emphasize the fact that, that it wasn't just the frontline people. We had to have the people that were registering uh, all the way to our pharmacy techs, all the way to our medical assistants, all the way to our uh, licensed vocational nurses. So we counted on, on a lot of, of uh, different uh, forms of healthcare to deal with an issue where we had to learn how to, of course, be cautious, uh, make sure we had the safety of not only our patients, not only our employees, but our family members, our visitors, uh, developing units that we never thought we'd develop. And uh, um, ensuring that the safety of, of our citizens were, were uh, upmost and upfront. Uh, I, I think that one of the things that I do wanna make sure to mention today is that we uh, as a community came together and, and we as a community need to support our youth so that they can continue on. 
I, I took the time this morning because I know that everybody that I'm talking to right now will be taking care of me pretty soon. Um, as, as I've reached over 50 plus, uh, it, it's important for us to understand that we need to invest into our future. I want to give you a quick statistics on our orthopedic surgeons in our area in the region. Uh, their average age is about 59 to 60 years old. So, you know, in about five years, they're looking to retire. Well, what's going to happen to all our needs here in this area? We need to invest in to make sure that we have our students looking into uh, different specialties, uh, different uh, nursing positions, um, and, and different uh, surgery fields. So um, I encourage everyone to be in the health system because uh, there's, there's always somebody told me the other day, um, you always have to go to a restaurant, you always have to go to healthcare. And, and, and it's true. You know, we, we need, we also found out that, that we needed to uh, communicate with our EMS providers and, and have um, our emergency medical technicians uh, out there to transport our patients, not only into our facility, but also into our specialized units that we formed. Um, and I don't know if there's any questions that anybody wants me to, to focus on. I just wanted to just touch up on uh, COVID related uh, jobs that we saw that that needed to be developed, uh, but it was something to me that was important. Do uh, you have a question? No, I don't see any questions in the in the YouTube chat. Um, you know, DHR is one of you know, they, they continue to to lead the way along with all their medical facilities uh, in what they're doing. And like you said, there is a big shortage. Um, what is some of the things that you did to get where you're at? Um, maybe a little bit of your education. Uh, and, and what you do on the day-to-day -day, um, in corporate affairs would be? Uh, well, it, it, uh, it's probably, I love coming to my job every single morning. Every single morning, something new. Uh, today, I'm talking to RGV lead students. Uh, next week, I'll be meeting the governor. Uh, the following week, we can... Uh, uh, Next week, you know, we can provide uh, a um, presentation to fifth grade students. So uh, my job as administrator of corporate affairs provides me with services, uh, including um, governmental affairs, which is dealing with the school districts and the city municipality services. Uh, it, it's included uh, the compliance. So I provide a resource to ensure that our clinics, uh, all 650 clinics are in compliance with our policies since we are a physician don't facility. Uh, we also, um, I also help out with the, the voting and we have a voting um, section in our, in our hospital because we think it's important for our hospital to vote. So uh, we join forces with the Advocacy Alliance Center of Texas which is a service, a nonprofit organization that's um, nonpartisan. So we encourage all our, our employees to go vote. Um, we also go and do function with community engagement. So I'm involved with uh, local chamber of commerce, uh, with different organizations that are not only in, um, in the in locally, but in surrounding areas. So, so it's it's an exciting job. I have a degree in uh, marketing, uh, but I also have a minor in biology and a minor in chemistry. Uh, it was a good understanding uh, because I I wanted to start off with um, actually wanted to be a scientist, and um, it it was very interesting uh, learning about biology and chemistry. That's why I have minors in them, but um, it it. I, I learned quickly that it was uh, exciting to promote service and support services and the health system without being an actual physician. So I've, I've been in an administrative position for over uh, 16 years now. And I think it's, it's very, um, it's, it's benefiting me because it, it allows me to help all our nonprofit organizations. I, I really help out uh, students, um, you, know, uh, you know, people that are in need, uh, people that are maybe lacking insurance. So, so we do a lot of things in our, um, in our area that maybe a lot of people are not aware of, but we're very proud of everything that DHR Health does because we, we are the last uh, locally owned hospital in this area and we want to make sure that we keep involved in the community. 
All right, Mr. Liscano, well, definitely thank you so much for sharing that information. I know that I run into you at a lot of different events. We're just recently at the McAllen, the RGB Food Bank, the Empty Bowls 15th anniversary event. Uh, so it's always great to see you out there and about. Like you said, you're always out and, and you know, networking and letting sharing the story of DHR and, and making sure that, uh, you know, the vision and the mission of DHR continue to be to be followed. So thank you so much for, for joining us and sharing that information. Thank you. And I just wish all your students the luck. And I just want to make sure that that uh, I reiterate what the person before me stated, which was uh, make sure that whatever you post on social media is a timestamp of your life. So make sure that you're making the right choices. If, if anything else, if you want to use social media, learn your current events every day, learn every day, early, early in the morning, read about all your current events so you can be uh, informative to other people and know and be in the know. Good luck. Thank you, to Thank you sir. You have a good day. All right. Well, next we have um, from Texas State Technical College uh, talking about the health information technology. Uh, Ms. Ramirez, are you with us, Ms. Ramirez? There you are. Start my video and can you hear me? We can hear you. Yes. Okay, great. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for having me uh, as part of this group. Um, I'm very excited to present our program because as you well know, TSTC, Texas State Technical College, offers over 30 programs of certificate and degrees, okay? And many times when students want something in the health field, because think about it, especially, I mean, before, right? But even more so now with pandemic, you're thinking, you know what? I want a secure job. You know, I want something in the medical field. But when you say medical field, what do people think of? They think of doctors and nurses, right? And they think the doctors and nurses, you know, pretty much do all the work. And yes, they do the health care. But guess what? If you want health care, and maybe you're one of those that it's like, mm, I don't want to deal directly with a patient care, or maybe you don't like the sight of blood, okay? This is something else to think about, okay? Because what we do is we take care of the documentation. You know, we gather it because from the very first moment that you go into the doctor's office, a medical record has to be created, right? So that medical record is created by us. We maintain it. We make sure that not just maintaining, you know, with the data, you know, we take your demographic information and everything else that we put together in that medical record and the forms that go in it, but we also look at what is in that medical record and we make sure that it's confidential. Okay, because somebody has to safeguard it, right? So in our program, you know, we have, we might have a student that goes in and, and works as a release of information person, okay? So for this program, you wanna make sure that you have your anatomies, your terminologies. Um, we've got a pathophysiology course that's taught in there. And when we look at pathophysiology is what is disease? What causes it? How to treat it, the signs and symptoms, you know? Um, health data content and structure. We're teaching you everything about the medical record, the different people that work with the medical record, all the personnel that takes care of it, okay? We have a course in there that's uh, legal aspects of healthcare because again, and I keep on going to safeguarding that medical information. I'm pretty sure you've heard of actresses, you know, somebody was in the hospital and they called and they got information on that person, okay? Well, somebody didn't do their job, okay? And we're there to make sure that that information is safeguarded, okay? Um, release of information also takes care of, let's say uh, the medical record gets subpoenaed, you know, we have to present it to the court, okay? We make sure that um, that gets done properly as well, okay? Um, you take anatomy and physiology one and two, okay? You take medical terminology and you take patho so that you can go into the coding classes, okay? I have students often say, you know what, ma'am? You have billing and coding, right? What is billing and coding, okay? Let's say, for instance, a patient goes into the facility and they have throat pain, okay? So they come in with tonsillitis, what we call inflammation of the tonsils, right? And so what are we gonna do? Are we gonna do a throat culture or are we gonna do a urinalysis? In other words, collect urine. The throat has nothing to do with the urine, right, down there. So guess what? If some code gets put into that urinalysis and gets submitted to the insurance company, is the insurance company going to pay for that? 
No, they won't. Okay. It wasn't medically necessary to do a UA, right? So that's part of the information that we look at too. We look at quantitative and qualitative analysis of that medical record. When I say quantitative, quantity, okay? If that patient had surgery and tissue was removed, because anytime, you know, something is removed, there has to be a pathology report, okay? So we look for signatures. Let's say the doctor did something specifically and at the bottom of that report, there's no signature. So we look at that, okay? Qualitative and quantitative. You know, the quality of the medical record is very, very important. Take, for instance, a patient's coming in and they're having, you know, there's so many different surgeries, right? But let's say we have a diabetic patient that's having the left foot amputated because, you know, there was dead tissue. So now they have to remove it. Well, if we look at that report and on the top of the report, it says left foot amputation, but then on the bottom of the report, somehow there was a mistake because we don't hear too often the medical errors, right? But they do happen. So at the bottom of the report, we see right foot amputation. And we're gonna be like, wait a minute, something is off, okay? So that quality of the medical record, we look at that. And we have to you know, get a hold of somebody. Okay, we need to fix this before the patient goes into surgery. And that's for any type of surgery. You know, Maybe the wrong kidney, is remove the right breast, the right, you know, I can go on and on, right? We want to make sure that that information is correct and updated. Okay. So um, back to the billing and coding. Okay. When we put, you know, codes to those diagnoses, tonsillitis, we did the throat culture, and we put codes there. Somehow, the patient coming into that facility the facility needs to re be reimbursed for the services that were given to that patient, right? So we submit to the insurance company, you know, the, that, um, that form that gets processed, okay? Okay, the patient came in with throat pain, we did a throat culture, it was medically necessary to do that procedure, the codes are, you know, are there correctly, we're going to go ahead and send reimbursement to that facility. So guess what? Billing is really important because we, you know, we do the services, but the facility, the healthcare professionals, we want to make sure that we get reimbursed for those services. Okay. So that's where your billing and coders come in. Some people come in even and say, you know what, I want to work from home. Well, guess what? Some of our students end up working from home, you know, towards the end of, you know, being at a facility and maybe uh, one or two years or three years, you know, working there and they work from home. Wouldn't it be nice, right? So, I mean, we, we look at many different aspects of the areas that we cover. So, you know, we don't do direct patient care, but we're a huge part of that healthcare system, that revenue circle where, you know, from the time we take the patient in, we create that medical record to the time the patient leaves, you know, in that processing of the claim forms and then taking the payment. I mean, it's a huge revenue circle that we that we cover. And there's so many different areas that our students can do. You know, one of the big things that um, I'm pretty sure you guys, you know, know TSTC is we do hands on, right? Even though we're in the pandemic area, the hold on, let me see. Um, I'm sorry, guys, the dog came in and I thought the door was open. So we're in the pandemic area, we want to make sure that, you know, we let the people know, yes, you want the healthcare field, but here we are as another part of the healthcare field. And you know that you're going to have a job. Think about it, you know, very, very, very needed in this healthcare arena. So one of the big things is that di um, direct lab work, you know, what we put to work, what we learned in the facility. And we don't just, you know, graduate you and say, okay, good luck, find a job. Guess what? We have a lot of places that call us and say, you know what, Beta, I need a biller. I need a coder. I need your best person that, you know, will take care of that medical record. So we've got people that call us. So many of our students you know, by the time they graduate, they already have a job lined up because guess what? They've done clinicals, okay? On that last semester before you graduate, you're doing your internship, internship practicum, you know, clinical rotation. So guess what? Some of our students doing that rotation, the employer tells them, go ahead and put an application because I would like you to work for us 
you know, uh, when you graduate. Okay. One of the uh, departments that we have also is we have where you can interview. Okay. We've got our own colleagues, our own faculty that sit in there and do the interview process so that you can get better, you know, at interviewing. One time I had a student and if she was a top student and we were like, God, why isn't she getting a job? Well, guess what? The interview process, you know, is getting you in the door and so that you can market yourself, right? Somehow this little student was so shy that she wasn't interviewing correctly, you know? So we have a department where you can, you know, go through that process and interview and maybe get better at, the, at it because with this pandemic, we're seeing our students a little bit more, you know, kind of sheltered and shy. And um, we want to make sure that you're sellable, you know, you market yourself properly so that the, that employer, you know, can hire you because that is your end goal. Now, Another huge thing about a program is, you know, how the doctors have MDs and the nurses have LVNs and RNs and so forth. At the end of the journey in our program, you're able to sit in and take a national exam. Now, this is a national exam. You can go anywhere in the nation with that credential. So you sit in for that exam and you get the credential registered health information technician. Okay. Isn't that awesome? I mean, that is great. That is the end goal. Okay. So, um, just to put it out there, you know, the students start with a certificate program. It's three semesters. We plug it into the associates. Okay. So ultimately you should, you know, be able to do it in, in five semesters. And then at the end of that journey, you graduate, you sit in for that national exam and you get that credential RHIT. Okay. I know I had to keep it kind of short, but I'm hoping that I covered, you know, many areas of what people don't know that we do <laughs> and that were very, very important in that whole, you know, revenue circle in that healthcare arena of taking care of that patient. You know, like Ms. Bettencourt um, said earlier, if it wasn't documented in the medical record, it wasn't done, okay? So we have CDIs, you know, your clinical documentation specialists that look at all that information and make sure that it's accurate, you know, that it's supposed to be there. All right, thank you, Ms. Ramirez. Definitely oh, a lot of great information. Thank, uh, thank you, you for, so much for, spending, for having me here. <laughs> spending some time with us and, and sharing uh, for the students, you know, what uh, your program has to offer and, you know, what it entails and, and what they could look forward to being able to do. So, Ms. Ramirez, thank you so much for being with us. You're welcome. Uh, next on the list from Texas Southmost College, uh, in the emergency medical science, we have Mr. Scott Nelson, and I would... Um, I would be uh, remiss to say that it is uh, National First Responder Day. Is that correct, Mr. That's Nelson? That's correct. Thank you so, for acknowledging that. I appreciate so, it. Uh, so uh, thanks for, for you uh, and the training that you provide to the local uh, EMTs uh, and preparing them um, for what they do. So thank yeah, you so thank much. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. So I just want to talk a few minutes about uh, the program that we offer. So um, I am, uh, my name is Scott Nelson. I am the program director of the emergency medical sciences program at Texas Southmost College. Um, I am a, a licensed paramedic. Um, I started my career in 1989. So I've got about 32 years in the field um, with some of that being in the field on ambulance, some of it being in fire departments. Um, I've done, had the opportunity to work in very remote areas um, so I've been kind of blessed to be able to work in uh, where I started my career in Colorado, um, spent some time working in Wyoming, spent uh, uh, several years working in Alaska, um, primarily in the Arctic Circle, and then coming down here to Brownsville um, to continue teaching. So I really uh, uh, love the job I'm doing. Um, <clears throat> there's an old cliche, and that cliche is, uh, you know, if you find a, a job you love, uh, you never work a day in your life. And that's true, um, and, and at least in my field, at least what I'm doing. So our program Program, uh, it's the Emergency Medical Sciences Program. So we are part of Emergency Medical Services. As uh, uh, Ms. Rodriguez mentioned, it is National First Responder Day. So, uh, you know, thank, thank the first responders. Those are law enforcement, um, uh, firefighters, um, EMS, and the emergency dispatchers. So please uh, make sure and, and thank them as you see them uh, as well. So let's talk a little bit about um, what EMS looks like. So 
a lot of th things that we look at is where can I work? What can I do? What can I uh, get hands on with? And the number one we think of for EMTs and paramedics is uh, ambulance service. Um, ambulance services, you can do the 911 responses. These are the folks that are responding uh, by ambulance um, to an emergency, whether it's a car crash or heart attack or uh, kind of anything in between. Um, we've delivered babies in the field. We have um, uh, seen people that were shot or stabbed or other traumatic injuries. Um, and it's a, it's a pretty amazing thing to be able to do. Uh, there are options for medical flight services. They call this helicopter EMS. Um, there's also fixed wing or airplane EMS. I have friends and colleagues who are working as paramedics who have the opportunity to travel not only across the US, um, but all over the world. Uh, I was speaking with a friend recently. I asked him where he was yesterday. He said, Paris. I said, Texas. He said, no, France. Um, and he was uh, picking up a patient there that needed to be transferred back to the US for uh, continued care. Um, obviously, fire departments, you see fire departments every day. Um, many of them have EMTs and or paramedics working with them. Uh, there are options for special events. Um, there are concerts that happen, and, and they need some first response or medical response, uh, usually on site for those. Um, those are a lot of fun. And how cool is it to get paid to watch some of your favorite artists. Other options include things like remote sites. There are uh, where we are here in, in the Gulf uh, of Mexico, or along the Gulf of Mexico. Um, there are lots and lots of oil rigs out here that all require uh, medical personnel to be on site because it's not easy to get to them, especially if the weather is not good. Uh, so those folks will do work for usually two weeks on and two weeks off. So they get helicoptered out uh, to the, the work site um, and they're basically available for 24 seven during that, that, uh, that two week stint. Um, same thing with cruise ships, uh, although these don't usually get helicoptered out to there, but they do require some kind of medical care uh, as well. So there's usually three main levels of EMS provider. Actually, Texas has five. Um, but I'm only going to focus on these three for just a moment. One of those is an emergency medical technician. This is sort of the EMT, the, the basic level uh, needed to get into the field. Um, it, it, part of the job is not simply driving the ambulance, although ambulance driver is part of the, the job description, um, but you're going to be there to assess patients, um, uh, try to decide on, on what their problems might be, um, and treat them, begin the treatment. There's an advanced emergency medical technician. This person has all the training of an EMT, um, which includes a handful of medications that we can provide, um, good thorough assessment, um, and, and treatment plans, but they also uh, have a few more medications they can provide, as well as some things like airway control, um, if you're not breathing, we want to breathe for you. We're going to do that for you. Um, at the paramedic level, and in Texas, this can be certified or licensed. Um, that paramedic is the highest level of EMS provider, at least in the entry level portion. Uh, these folks generally work on ambulances or fire engines, um, and we have additional uh, um, medications that we can provide. We have uh, much more in-depth training on patient assessment. Um, we have uh, a few more diagnostic tools as well as major airway control and things like that for patients who again are not breathing or um, have other problems that we need to, to address. So the education really varies based on your goal. You can receive certification. This is, these courses are typically less than one year. Uh, EMT is the example of that. For our program, that's one semester. Uh, 16 weeks will get you trained as an EMT. Uh, and that includes some classroom time and some clinical time. So we are going to send you out to see real life patients. Now, we're not sending you out there to take control of everything on a, on a patient uh, encounter, but you're there observing other uh, medical professionals doing their job and you're learning from what you're seeing. You do get some hands on, you do get to uh, assess patients and take vital signs um, and engage with them. And that's one of the things that we find the most useful. Uh, there's an option for an associate's degree. Typically, this is a two year uh, uh, program. Our hours, for example, is a five semester program. So it's not two full years, but you can complete that uh, fairly quickly. And then there's options for bachelor's degree. These are typically the four year uh, university level. Um, I do have a bachelor's degree minus in business administration, not in EMS, because when I started, that wasn't an option. Um, so what do you need to do in order to work? You have to complete approved training. We are uh, approved by the Texas Department of State Health Services, and we are uh, also accredited by uh, the Committee on the Accreditation of Allied Health Education Programs. Um, that's what you want. You want a, a, a program that meets those requirements. Um, and then you have to have licensure or certification or registration. Um, I hold a national registry. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm listed in a registry database um, that says that I meet certain requirements that allow me to work in some states if I make the next couple of steps. And one of those is because we are in a p p position of public trust, this it's 
required by the state that they assure that I am a good person. So they're going to do a background check. They may include a, a, a drug use check um, and so forth. And they want to make sure that, that you really are um, an appropriate person to go into places that most people don't get invited to. So we go into people's homes. We go into people's cars that are uh, turned over on the highway. We go into businesses. Um, at the request of folks asking us to, to come uh, help them with the emergency. Once you receive the certification, you have to maintain it. Uh, there's a, a continuing education requirements for each of these levels, um, and it depends on which level you're looking at. Uh, certainly, I'm happy to help answer those questions if you have que specific questions about what the certification level is um, for you uh, in terms of how many hours it is. I can tell you that I, uh, as a paramedic, I have to complete 60 hours of continuing education every two years in order to maintain my paramedic license. And again, it really varies from state to state and sometimes by employer. I've worked for employers that uh, required you to have um, more than the minimum requirement um, in very specific areas. So they may focus on pediatrics or geriatrics, so children or older people um, and so forth. So what do we do? Well, we, we provide emergency care outside of a hospital. It's considered pre-hospital. Um, we do provide care and comfort for victims of accidents and, and, and injuries and sudden illness. Uh, we can also... Um, provide uh, transport if I have a patient at one hospital and um, the care they need is provided at another hospital. We, so we provide those transfer um, opportunities as well. Uh, what kind of jobs are there? Well, there's EMTs. So these are, again, certificate courses. Um, there are paramedics. So again, these folks, all, all these folks generally work on an ambulance. You can work in a medical office. You can work in hospital emergency rooms. Uh, I know some of the freestanding uh, emergency rooms here in the, the lower Rio Grande Valley um, employ EMTs to, to work. Um, other options, of course, include first responder units. We see fire, law enforcement. I've seen security guards that are trained as EMTs. Um, again, special events, uh, remote or offshore locations. And the big question, of course, is how much money can I make? Well, at starting out, uh, you can make between twenty-one and and, and twenty-three thousand dollars a year as a as an EMT as a paramedic. Um, the range goes from about uh, 29000 to about uh, six, just under $60,000 a year. Um, so it's a good opportunity. And one of the cool things about this job is you don't work every single day. Um, a lot of these folks will work uh, 24 or 48-hour shifts, and then you're usually off for 24 or 48 hours after that. So you get a little bit of downtime, um, go hang out at the beach, go play, uh, travel, whatever it is that you want to do. Um, so our program we have an Associate of Applied Science. We also offer some certificate level courses. So we have certificate level one that will help you become an EMT. Um, we have certificate level two, which will help you become a paramedic, but not eligible for licensure. In the state of Texas, there's two levels of paramedic. One is certified, which means that they have taken the paramedic training um, from an accredited program. Um, and the licensed person has also taken that uh, paramedic training, but they have a degree. Um, so our degree includes things like general psychology, um, a math class, um, English, um, a communications course. Um, and we really wanted to make sure that our uh, licensed paramedics are coming out as well-rounded folks that can move on to a bachelor's degree if they would like to. Again, I, I've kind of mentioned the, uh, the opportunities uh, for, for work. Um, I do want to mention there's also opportunities to work overseas or in offshore environments. So there's really, a, a, man, you can kind of go wherever you want to go. Um, for a while, I was getting phone calls from friends who were working in Kuwait and China and Australia asking if I could come. Um, the unfortunate thing is I couldn't because I have kids and I wanted to make sure that I was there uh, for my kids um, because those usually uh, require a six to 12 month commitment. Um, I'm happy to be here. Thank you for your time today. If you would like to reach out to me, um, you can reach me by email at scott.nelson at tsc.edu. Uh, you can find us on our webpage at tsc.edu forward slash EMS. Um, uh, Mr. Rodriguez, do you have any other questions for me? Uh, I'm going to take a look real quick on the, ch the YouTube chat. I don't see any questions there. Um, I do appreciate your time. Just like you said, I, um, in living in Austin, I had a lot of friends that were actually, uh, you know, in the first responders between firefighters and, and paramedics. And, you know, you talked about being able to go see your favorite band kind of being right in the middle of it, you know, ACLs, all the concerts at the thing. So they, they're like, yep, I saw them. I saw them. And it's just like, man, I had to pay a hundred dollars to see them. You were working exactly. and you were getting paid to see them. So. Exactly. So we had, uh, <laughs> we had Red Rocks in Colorado. So it's right outside of Denver and every, uh, every band that you hear is ask, what's your favorite place? They all tell you Red Rocks is the place. And I, I, I actually lost track of how many concerts I got to work there. So uh, the cool thing is you were right there front and center, kind of wherever mm -hmm. you want to be. So yeah, thanks uh, for, for that. So it's always fun to, to meet folks that uh, enjoy the, the job, you know? Well, Mr. Nelson, thank you so much. Definitely appreciate everything you do for um, our future 
you know, first responders uh, here locally at TSC. Great program. Um, thank you once again. Thanks so much. Have a good day. All right. Next we have um, from South Texas College, we have um, the Bachelor of Science in Nursing, Claudia Camacho. Ms. Camacho, the floor is yours. Hello, everybody. I'm Claudia Camacho. I'm from South Texas College representing the nursing programs. Um, I wanted to talk about the Bachelor's of Science in Nursing, but since you're in high school, I think I might confuse you a little bit because our bachelor's is an RN to be assigned. That means that you have to be a registered nurse already before you can transition into our program. Um, so I'll give you the little uh, spiel about our associate's degree. As most of you know, and I think uh, they've covered it already, like uh, Mr. Lozano, Liscano, uh, said we're in need of nurses. So we're trying to produce as many, but we want to produce safe, competent, um, caring nurses for our community. Okay, so um, without further ado, let me start this my slide. Hope y'all can see this. Can you see this? Or what can you see? We do see it. We, we see that we're, we're good. Okay, so I think I should share screen two, no? Do you see? Okay, so I'll just go with this one. All right, so we're, we have two different programs. We have a nursing pathway, which is patient care, vocational nursing, ADN, and then the BSN program. You can go through any pathway except for, like directly, except for the BSN program. So our program here at STC, you know, we want to quality patient-centered. We want to produce these quality patient-centered nurses for our healthcare team to help uh, with, you know, our patients. And remember that nurses are the liaison between the hospital and the physician, okay? So they're not just, uh, whatever you see on Gray's Anatomy, it's not true, okay? So please don't think that. Um, this is uh, the real world is different. We are approved by the Texas Board of Nursing and our nursing program is accredited by, the, by national accreditation. This accreditation is very important because this means we meet the standard for national programs, associate degree nursing programs, and the BSN program is also in the path, is, we're also in the process of getting that national accreditation, okay? There are certain standards that we have to meet when we do this, accreditation and it's not easy. So just be aware of that. Um, like I said, we have nursing uh, pathways so you can look at those at our website. Um, students typically spend five to six weeks on campus. So if you decide to come to the nursing program, um, the classes are full-time, they're during the day and we meet face-to-face, -face, okay? You will attend um, the clinical sites and this is face-to-face. -face. The Texas Board of Nursing um, does not give way, even during the COVID, that our students could do um, online clinical, not for associate's degree. You have to do the face-to-face. -face. Um, if available, um, we take applications twice per year. We admit anywhere from 60 to 120 uh, fall and spring. Um, so, and then, Yes, that's when the new cohorts begin, okay? You can participate in an information session only because there is so much to cover in the nursing program. And um, we want you to have the, the correct requirements, okay? You must be TSI college ready and complete all prerequisites for the beer batter. Since this is a competitive program, I usually tell my students, please obtain grades of A. Like I said, this is a competitive program. In a competition, what do you want to do? You want to win. So you need to have those A's, okay? Uh, to be, because we rank students from highest to lowest. There is an exam that you're going to have to take. It's called HESI. This is our entrance exam into the program, not to the college. This is into the program. Once you take that exam, you're eligible to register for introduction to nursing and then you must have a cumulative GPA of a 3.0 to a 4.0. We usually tell students also do not ruin your GPA because if you're trying to go into any healthcare field, they look at that GPA, especially when you're in high school and you're taking dual enrollment courses. Please 
please, 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 I cannot emphasize this enough. Take care of your GPA, okay? Especially if you're gonna go into healthcare, okay? You must pass a criminal background check and attend panel of drug and alcohol screen. Um, and we will give you all this information once you decide to come into our program. Once you finish that, you will take the National Counselor Licensure Exam. This is a national exam. So whether you get a BSN at a university or the associate's degree at STC, you're still going to test for the same national exam, okay? And then let's say you get your eight associate's degree nursing here with STC, and you take this NCLEX RN, you pass it, you become an RN, and then you can do your BSN. After you do the BSN, which is one year with STC, you don't have to test again for the NCLEX RN, okay? So just be aware of that. It's the same national exam, whether you get a university four-year BSN or a two-year associate's degree with STC, okay? Um, <clears throat> we... I mean, we want, then what do, you, what do you do after that? Then we want you to transition into the R and to be ascent. We usually tell our students is you're already in the momentum of going in through, uh, you know, study hard, that study schedule. And because in the ADN program, it's rigorous. You're all you're doing is reading, studying, eating, nursing, nursing. And so if you're already in that momentum, transition into the BSN program meet with an academic coach so that they can inform you to see what you've been missing so that you can transition right away. Because it's very hard to go out there and do the money and everything, and then you come back and to do get that momentum of studying, reading, developing your brain again to, um, to, what do you, to um, be in that routine again, it's difficult because our students have done it. I have nurses right now that are in the program that have been nurses for 22 years, okay? Or 15 years or 12 years. And they're like, oh, Ms. Camacho, okay, I'm gonna do this. And then they come back and they're, they're about to finish in the fall. So that's a good thing. So when you come here, we have a, once you transition into the BSN program, we have a 12 month and an 18 month program, okay? If you do the part-time, it's gonna take you a little longer, but hey, once you start, don't stop, okay? And this program is right now is available only in the spring. So you apply in the fall, and then if you start, you, you uh, start in the spring. Every spring we're taking. Um, this pro the BSN program is offered entirely online. So once you become the registered nurse and then you transition into the BSN, that program will be entirely online. So you can be working at the bedside at the hospital. You can be working at a home health. And then you get home, you sleep. If you've done a 12, 14 hour shift, you go home, you sleep. And then you get up, okay, I'm going to do some BSN work. This program is entirely online, okay? It'll take time and dedication, but it won't be as rigorous like the ADN because unlike the associate's degree in nursing, you have to be on campus and meet those contact hours. That's just a little different, okay? Um, once you begin the BSN program, you must have that R license, okay? We need to convert associate's of applied science degree in nursing that you did complete the program, that your cumulative GPA was a 2.5 or higher, and that you had at least 24 credit hours of core curriculum. But what I usually tell students is before you're trying to get into the program, please make sure that you have um, more credit hours because you have to complete the core plus the BSN courses when you graduate, okay? And then attend an information session uh, with us so that we can uh, tell you what you might need. Um, I know I've given you a lot of information regarding the program, and it's a, <laughs> um, this is the shortest advising session I've ever done. Our advising sessions are usually like about an hour, an hour and a half. Um, there's so much to do when you come into a nursing program, so please come and get properly advised. Reach out to us. We're at the webpage, Nursing and Allied Health uh, with South Texas College. Um, we have very good results. Uh, we usually graduate about 250, 260 students a year, and we don't make a dent in the community. Um, our, our nursing students who are graduating in December, the hospitals are whining and dining them even before they're here. 
they're asking you to sign a contract. They will give them sign-on bonuses because they're in such need, desperate need of nurses. Okay. Um, uh, so if you graduate with an associate's degree of nursing, just let me tell you, when you become the RN, you will never be out of a job. Even before COVID happened, our hospitals were still in desperate need because in the, the nursing shortage was double. And when COVID happened, it quadrupled in size, even more. I think it's six, six times higher than it was before. So are we in need of nurses? Yes. And we, I thought that because of COVID, we were not going to see applicants. Our applications for, for the nursing students have doubled in size. And we can't take everybody. UTRGD can't take everybody. RGD can't take everybody. You know, we're trying, uh, we're trying to expand our program, but it's hard. Um, so if you want to come in, come and get properly advised and let us know how we can help you, okay? If this is really your passion and this is what you want to do, we're here for you. I thank you for your time and good luck, everybody. Um, and like I said, one thing I do emphasize, if you're doing dual enrollment, do not, do not ruin your GPA. Thank you for your time. Ms. Camacho, thank you so much. Yes, um, you know, you shared a lot of information I was listening and it's, it's like you say, you, you probably barely scratched the surface on being able to share with these students, but you gave them a good insight of, you know, what it ent entails. And South Texas College is doing a lot of great things, just as as well as TSTC, UTRGB, yes. you know, TSC. <laughs> we are all one here in the Rio Grande Valley. So it's all, it's all about opportunities and giving these students, you know, just like we're doing now at the Expo. So Thank you so much for being for spending some time with us this morning. Uh, next, I believe we have a video uh, presentation from Texas Southmost College Associates of Arts in Social Work from Miss Martha Warburton. So, Anthony, you want to share that video? Social work. It's a field focused on helping people and the career opportunities are endless. An Associate of Arts in Social Work at Texas Southmost College will not only prepare you to transfer to most bachelor programs throughout Texas, but it will also provide you the 60 credit hours you need for many state careers. One of the things I love about the profession is the diversity. More than half of the mental health services in the United States are delivered by licensed clinical social workers. So if you're interested in an entrepreneurial, I'm going to own my business and be a licensed counselor, a clinical counselor, you can do that. Examples of other career opportunities include therapy for individuals, families, marriages, and children, social workers for school districts, and emergency social workers in hospitals and police departments. Because our students do hands-on volunteer work, they also develop some contacts in the community. If they decide that instead of moving on for a bachelor's degree, they would like to be employed, it's easier for them because they've had it and they've done it as part of their volunteer work with the class. If you think about the changes that people have in their lives and the life challenges that can hit a person and the places where you're going to need someone to help you and someone who will be on your side and not making money off of you, chances are a social worker is one of the people who will be there. All right, thank you for Ms. Warburton to be able to submit that video. I know she had a packed schedule, but she wanted to make sure she could share some information uh, on behalf of her program at Texas Southmost College. Um, that concludes um, session five. Uh, we're a little bit ahead of time. What you can expect next is a QR code. Um, go ahead and put your camera up to it, complete the survey, let us know how we did, how we can improve, you know, some suggestions. Uh, you'll be in the running for, we have four Chromebooks along with two wireless printers. We wanna make sure that, uh, you know, 
you are getting the most out of this expo and we're bringing the right folks to the table. One of the other things that I wanted to mention was we, we know there are a lot of presenters. If you've been with us for, for some of these um, sessions is they're talking about um, the, the, the pay and, and entry level and RGV lead um, for several years now has put together an RGV lead labor market report. And in that we put together um, targeted occupations along with high demand occupations uh, and it encompasses all the way from Laredo down to, to South Padre Island, Brownsville, Texas. And it gives you a good indication of if you're interested in a per, uh, particular uh, career field, it tells you how many annual openings there are. It also gives you the information in regards to, it gives you also the information in regards to the, the entry level, the middle, the experienced. And then we tie that together with what education you're going to need and what local institution offers that. So if you have an opportunity, um, reach out to us. Um, those have, have just gotten printed. Um, we, we do have them in our office. We're going to start disseminating them to all our school district partners um, for, for students and, and, and teachers to utilize. But uh, if, if you're a, a managing or a, a member of RGB Lead, a paying member, um, let us know. And if you want an electronic copy, we can definitely share that. So you can share that with students. Those are for the educators or students. If you're interested, just let us know. We're here to serve. Thank you so much. And uh, we will see you um, back at 115. If you're joining us for session six, it's the last session um, for the 20th annual Career and Education Expo. Once again, thank you so much to all our presenters. You all have a good day. We'll see you soon.